Reconciliation and reconstruction in Syria and Iraq is the topic we will be discussing with my guests here, Mr. Saleh Hassan, head of Al Hikma Dialogue and Cooperation Center, Joel Rayburn, Deputy Assistant Secretary and Special Envoy for Syria, Ghassan Hasbani, Deputy Prime Minister of Lebanon, Alam Bajani, Chief Executive Officer of Majid Al Futaim Holding, and Lina Alaimi. Managing Director of 3BL Associates. I will start my question with you, Sayyid Saleh Al-Hakim, Your Eminence. What comes first, reconciliation or reconstruction in these countries that have witnessed destruction, especially Syria and Iraq? In the name of God, most merciful, most compassionate, allow me first to express my heartfelt thanks to Al Arabiya and to all the media efforts covering this forum. We can see the efforts uh, deployed in the coverage of this uh, forum, which is being held at a pivotal point in time and in a country as esteemed as Jordan. Once again, I reiterate my thanks. And let me tell you that we cannot have reconstruction without having community stability and peace. And to have that, we need to have convictions where the community and the whole of society would feel the need to have coexistence and that the interest of the people lies in peace lies in cooperation. Cooperation must be based on the joint interests, the common interests. Without this type of stability and peace, we cannot have reconstruction. In fact, peace is the first step to the building of spirits. In the Holy Quran, there is a verse that states what means, ye who believe enter into peace do not follow the steps of the devil, meaning if we leave the state of peace, even if it's a minority of you, you will be entrapped with the devil or by the devil in the form of wars, uh, wars and destruction. So peace in the community is the basis of reconstruction. But this does not, did not happen in Iraq because after 2003, the war in Mosul ended in 2017. And up until now, we still do not have true reconciliation in Iraq, right? Yes, that is true. Reconciliation is an ideolo ideology. It must start from within. And to make reconciliation, we need to have politics and facing this manufacturing of peace, we have the manufacturing of hatred. And whenever society and the community insists on living, on coexistence, on tolerance and acceptance of others, and this is what happened after our young people liberated Iraq from ISIS or Daesh, they became convinced, everyone, all Iraqis became convinced that they have common interests. And this is why now we have grown to be optimistic, donning this new phase, which could be the true starting point of a true reconciliation. Mr. Hasbani, Lebanon went through a 15-year war, which ended a long time ago. Reconstruction took place. And up until now, no one apologized to anyone else, and we still do not have any reconciliation. So can we say that Lebanon could also be on the verge of a civil war which has or whose wounds have not healed? Well, this does not happen in a certain point of time. Reconciliation happens as a process. It has to go through different stages. It may require a generation, a full generation of citizens for reconciliation to be fully achieved. And reconciliation should happen at several levels because the problems that took place in the war are multidimensional. It's not only sectarian. It's not only partisan. It's not only political or with external or internal ties. In the previous civil war uh, in Lebanon or in any other war, 
reconciliation has to be a long-term process that requires human, intellectual, and cultural efforts. Also, efforts at the procedural level, because in reconciliation, we need to have documentation. We need uh, to have uh, agreements that are executed and implemented so that a reconciliation is a fully completed. So you asked me a question. Yes, if Lebanon is um, in danger. Lebanon has many dangers, but throughout its history, it was able to overcome them one way or another when it was able to face these threats with all of its components and when we agreed on the main dossiers among all the Lebanese uh, actors. So have the Lebanese uh, or does the Lebanese, do the Lebanese have reconciliation? Yes, but not according to what we understand of reconciliation. The main challenge is how to build institutions to deeply concretize this reconciliation and to step up towards joint action to build the economy and the nation. So reconciliation in itself is not sufficient. It needs to be followed by practical steps such as documenting the reconciliation, promoting it, enhancing it, and working on building institutions that would guarantee and preserve the results of this reconciliation in order to build a state. Mr. Bajani, you are an investor and the head of Al Futaim Holding. Do you invest in a country which is economically promising, but which did not have any politi national political reconciliation? Thank you, Rima. As you know, it is very difficult for any human being to look at a certain uh, reality and uh, be hesitant. Same thing goes for investment, for reconstruction, and uh, the natural cycle of life. They cannot wait for any other procedure. We could have reconciliation. We could have certain procedures that are n necessary. But there are needs and there are opportunities that need to be used, especially by the private uh, sector first. al Time holding is truly committed to the region, and our presence in the region is essential for us. We try to contribute to stability through creating jobs, to having economic growth and investment. When we take this into account and when we view reality, we can see that there are some countries in the region that have witnessed some drawbacks or have certain situations that impeded their progress and development. So we try to find investment opportunities and economic opportunities to be available regardless of anything else. But here we're talking about two countries, Iraq and Syria. These two countries suffer from wars. Do they need to have security, stability, and reconstruction so you can invest? Or would you invest whenever you find an opportunity where there is some kind of uh, political uh, calm? Of course, security stability is important. But political stability is something else. It can be discussed. But for security, this is necessary. We cannot invest in a country which uh, doesn't have a rule of law, where we have a, a different uh, law that is um, implemented, or else investment would be difficult. Look at all countries that have gone through these challenges. You see that internal and external investments are not available. They're, they cannot happen. So. That's very clear. In English, if uh, that suits you. Thank you. So um, probably Americans have said it over the past weeks, mission is accomplished in Syria. Uh, that's not what we've said. What we have said is that uh, the, uh, uh, the US-led uh, coalition, along with our local partners, including the Syrian Democratic Forces, have been successful at destroying the physical caliphate of Daesh. But we haven't said that that's the end of the story with respect to Daesh. And there's a further phase uh, to the campaign against Daesh that has to take place. Have to keep the pressure against Daesh so that they can't reconstitute themselves and present a new threat. Uh, there has to be a stabilization phase uh, for the territories that have been liberated from Daesh so that those local communities can be inoculated against the threat of Daesh coming back. That means addressing grievances, but that means also 
uh, creating a, a secure environment well, where people can pursue livelihoods and so on, at the same time that there is a continued military pressure uh, of a different kind, it looks much more like law enforcement uh, to, uh, uh, to keep pressure on uh, the clandestine networks of Daesh. They've ceased to be a caliphate. They have reverted, and they already had plans to try to revert, to being a clandestine terrorist network that could still pose a threat, and also uh, an insurgency that could pose a threat against, uh, against local authorities. So we don't say the job is done. We say a lot of progress has been made. If you think about uh, the way the situation looked in, at the beginning of 2017, when you had Daesh still in control of one of the great Arab cities, Mosul, and Arab capitals and in control of Raqqa and a great deal of eastern Syria. I think uh, to imagine that just two years later that that caliphate would be, uh, would be physically destroyed, uh, that was something that no one expected at the time. Two years after the fall, uh, the, the, the finishing off of ISIS in Mosul, Mosul is even worse than what it was. And I bet you in two years, three years, Raqqa won't look much different. Uh, why isn't the U.S. involved in the reconciliation process, but only the battles and the fighting of ISIS only? Well, I, I, I'd say that that's, I, I'd say that we are involved in, in the reconciliation process. First of all, uh, the difference, as I see it, uh, the difference between sides in the Syrian conflict is not between regime opposition or Iranians and, uh, and those who oppose them, uh, Russia, etc. The difference in the Syrian conflict is between those who believe that, a, that their aims can be achieved through a military solution and those who believe that there can only be a political solution to the Syrian conflict. The United States is firmly on the side of uh, the belief that this conflict has to be solved politically. There is no military solution that's coming. None of the parties to this conflict can get to their end goal through military means. After more than eight years of conflict, that reality should have sunk in by now. Unfortunately, there are still those, in the Assad regime first and foremost among them, who are pursuing a military solution to this conflict. That is just making peace further and further away. There will be no military end to the conflict because the causes of the conflict were political. They were political and social. That means that they require a political and a social solution. You can't paper over those, or you can't military over those, let's say, with a military solution and think that you've addressed the root causes of the conflict. So you still say Assad must go? We don't say that. What we say is that there has to be a political settlement to the conflict. There has to be a political process that has the buy-in of, of all the parties uh, in order for there to be a sustainable solution. And we also think that at the end of that political process, there should be a government in Syria that behaves differently towards its people and behaves differently in the region so that it, it ceases to be hostile to its people fundamentally and then it ceases to be hostile to its neighbors fundamentally. And that's the only way to get to a sustainable peace in Syria. Mrs. Olaimi, when we speak about um ISIS, when we speak about Mosul, when we speak about um, um, Syria territories that were under ISIS, um, we see a lot of uh, youth involved in those battles. Uh, how, how are they able to reconcile themselves? Uh, they're either gone to prison or they're just roaming around because someone is going to arrest them. When we talk about reconciliation, it seems to happen between political parties whereby we're dealing with militias and paramilitary forces that the world is getting used to. How do these young people reconcile? So, I mean, just building on the comment that was just made, one of the most memorable conversations I had in 2011 was with the Desmond Tutu Foundation. And they were saying how they regretted waiting so long to focus on development and actually involving civil society while they were fighting for a political solution. Because it meant that even after apartheid, um, generations are still going through the same broken systems. And this is what we're seeing today. You can remove a leader, you can change a policy, you can end a war, but what happens the next day? 
all the societal conditions, the economic inequalities, the racial tensions, they're still very much there and they can take generations to overcome. So actually with youth, what we need to do is peace and reconciliation is not the absence of conflict or war or humanitarian uh, atrocities. If we wanna look at a more ambitious vision of peace, which is a positive state of flourishing, um, acceptance, um, equity, equality, that needs to be built before we actually reach conflict. We need to be peace building rather than looking at conflict and reconciliation as a point of departure. Um, a lot of these youth are not joining extremist movements for ideological reasons. They're joining because of unemployment. They're joining because they can't afford to get married. They're joining because they were politically marginalized. All of these reasons don't, all of these grievances are actually made worse by military intervention. And we can't, if we expect them to reconnect with their humanity, we can't dehumanize them as violent extremists who actually don't experience things like empathy because a lot of them join extremist movements because they're empathetic. So we don't put them in prisons. No, I didn't say that. So being empathetic or compassionate, it's not a soft, oh, we should just love them and not you know, put them in prison or bring them to justice. Relax, we need to bring them to justice, but the intention shouldn't be punitive. It needs to be that we are helping to rehabilitate them and protect them even when they're acting not in their own self-interest. Yes. Uh, your Eminence, Lina spoke about the reasons of war and Mr. Rayburn was saying that the, the solution in Syria must be political. Iraq did not have any sectarian strife in the last few years, but only after 2003 that this has changed. So. Is political reconciliation in the hand of uh, partisan entities or political entities or clergymen? Because in the heart of the conflict, we find a Sunni-Shia conflict or Shia-Shia or Sunni-Sunni or Christian-Muslim. I think ISIS kills more Sunni than Shias in some areas. So it's sectarian par excellence. They tried to transform the conflict into a sectarian conflict, but they weren't able to do so. That is because the nature of the Iraqi society is a double. We are a tribal community, and tribes themselves are or include Shiites and Sunnis. And the Christians are loved by everyone because they are a point of equilibrium in Iraq. We never felt that we tend towards a certain entity or denomination. It was a pure political conflict and not a societal conflict. Of course, there were some uh, messages sent uh, by Zarqawi and others telling that uh, kill more Sunnis and Shiites in order to have more conflict between them. The sectarian problem in, uh, or the sectarian issue in uh, Iraq was not successful, although they wanted to have sectarian conflict. Our problem is the accumulation of a struggle, of dictatorship, of unemployment, which made our society filled with tension and they became extremist, and this needs to be treated. Clergymen played an important role of all faiths, and they have proven, not only because I am a, a clergyman I say that, it's not paying lip service, but this is a fact that the religious reference in Najaf, the Sunnis, the Christian, all these faith clergymen played an important uh, role in uh, stability and peace, but they also put fire or put oil on the fire. No, not from the clergymen, maybe a minority who are not true religious references. They, are, they were taken advantage of by the politicians. The struggle in Iraq is between religious extremism, which was uh, imported or it was muggled into Iraq. We never had this extremism, whether among the Sunnis or the Shia. There's, there was no difference between them. We had coexistence. And I always say political Islam, whenever we introduce religion in politics, 
so it becomes like a, a political bazaar and it corrupts both religion and politics. Our Iraqi society is aware of that. The Iraqi society knows that religion has its place, politics has its place, and they know how religion was taken advantage of by uh, politicians. And this awareness was born from the suffering of the Iraqi society. I am highly optimistic uh, by the Iraqi youth and by uh, the Iraqi future. When we say reconciliation, it must start with awareness. And we truly have awareness among our citizens. And it was very clear when the young people of Iraq insisted on kicking out Daesh. So now young people left the extremist uh, Shia uh, militias, but they will join whom? They need to begin with uh, job opportunities. They need to have paid jobs. Our religious reference is very clear about this. We want to promote the state of law. Without that, we cannot have reconstruction. We cannot have reconciliation. We need a people who understands coexistence, who respects others and their opinions, and citizens who have a state which is transparent, which has the rule of law, where everyone is under the law. These are the basic points or basic foundations of the building of the Iraqi society or any society. The Iraqi society has taken the right steps towards the right direction, and there are even popular demands, the people are demanding the government, so the government feels under pressure to meet these demands. Mr. Haspani, today, while being a member of the Lebanese uh, government, you see people who are involved in the war which took place 20 or 30 years ago. Some of them are princes of war, they have uh, political parties, and uh, they used to be heads of militias during the war. Regardless of the fact of whether they had reconciliation or not, they are now sitting around the same table discussing government issues. This happened in Iraq, in Libya, and perhaps it will happen in Syria. Will the international community today say to Bashar al-Assad, let's turn the page. Now let us move on to, f to solving the problems of refugees, of reconstruction of ISIS. To answer, and here I'm speaking on a personal status, I say that every country has its own situation, position, and circumstances. As His Eminence said, if we do not have a law above everyone, if we do not have regulations to control the economy, the society, to build the state and its institutions, regardless of whether we have reconciliation at the level of the people or not, we will not have sustainable stability. Of course, if there were major crimes that were perpetrated and they need to be set to justice, we can follow international, or if the international community finds there is a need to follow justice, they will do so. South Africa, for example, entered into a well-known reconciliation phase after uh, the long problems it suffered from. So it's on a case-by-case -case basis. The only common denominator is when the state of institutions is built and when the rule of law starts after a pre preliminary reconciliation, all reconciliations are promoted and we go towards citizenship and the issue of sectarianism and politicization is set aside and the whole community moves on to constructive competition even and not only cooperation. This is promising, this is beautiful to hear. But in Lebanon, you are the first victims of Syrian uh, refugees. Or this is what the Lebanese uh, government states. In my personal opinion, I believe that uh, they are most welcome and they are uh, at their home. But the Lebanese government is suffering from this refugee status and you need a solution. To achieve what you are talking about, 
in Syria, we need 10 years. In this time, in the meantime, where will the refugees be? When we talk about the return of refugees, we do not target the people who suffered from the war and who came to Lebanon and were hosted by Lebanon. The issue of return is for their own sake so that they can go and start with the reconstruction of their own country to go back to their own communities and to their own countries. In addition to that, Lebanon carries a large burden because almost 40% of the residents of Lebanon are of refugees and they all came in a short period of time and this exerted great pressure on the infrastructure of Lebanon, economic and social. And this is why we want to collaborate with the international community so that they can return. Shall we return for a full end of conflict in Syria so that they return? Not necessarily. They can return to the regions where we have minimum stability and security for them so that they can return because this also is part of promoting and enhancing security in Syria when they go back home safe and sound. The first thing is to have areas that are safe for them. This is the first step. A second is uh, the second step is going back home so that they can contribute to the reconstruction and the stability of their own country and of course to contribute to the economic and social stability of Lebanon, the country that has hosted them or any country that hosted refugees such as Jordan. Mr. Bajani, before I end up with the issue of political reconciliation, we've heard uh, of uh, from uh, people, clergymen, uh, civil society who took part took in the government. Uh, do you hold any responsibility as a private sector, as businessmen, as investors towards these countries, the countries uh, that are uh, that are re being reconstructed after a war, undoubtedly from what we've heard recently, that the main groundwork that led to a number of suffering in the region is the is the bad economic situation and the terrific economic situation in, in numerous countries in the region during the past years. This led to the establishment of a groundwork and the, uh, and the establishment of an environment that have contributed to extremism. Undoubtedly, the private sector in the region, which is playing a great role, which can contribute in creating jobs and can also build economy is essential and primordial. If we look at how the region have dealt with the private sector in general, few are the countries that knew, that know the value of private sector and the private sector was given uh, the opportunities it needed. Uh, uh, we need uh, uh, the the we need economic uh, deterioration really is uh, uh, an incubator of extremism. We cannot fight extremism without having strategic plans to build strong economies in the regions, and this requires openness. It requires a state of law. It requires for the private sector to play a pivotal role in the in reconstruction, in reconstructing the country's uh, post-war. If we do not reach the solution, we will always face problems because we will always have a fertile ground for extremism, fundamentalism, and problems. Do you want the public sector to be part in the political decision-making process because uh, the decisions of war and peace are taken and then we ask the private sector to help. Uh, you always are asked to come to the rescue. You are asked for job opportunities, otherwise the youth will go to extremism. You are asked to reconstruct, otherwise something will happen. Public sector, yes, of course. I will not say that public sector is responsible in, in the extent that it is the, the party that should provide this. But it is the party that's providing job opportunities today, the governments that are in the region. There is a kind of conciliation that governments cannot only be the sole source of employment for the youth. The private sector has uh, to shoulder this responsibility, and undoubtedly, like it is in the West, uh, in extreme countries, uh, the public sector, uh, the private sector, uh, should be part of the political process. I should take that in the, into consideration because uh, development is economic development. The development of societies is based on economic development that allows to develop also other uh, corners. So this is why in the region we have to have more awareness on the issue. We have to allow the participation of the private sector to build a, an effective groundwork for economic development. Before continuing our discussion, we will uh, take a small break and then we'll continue with this panel. Thank you. Uh, we're not stopping.
الكل بيقول انه المشكله انه ما في فرص عمل بس ما بنعالج عملية الاقتصاد نحكي Welcome back, and we will continue with this panel discussion on reconciliation and uh, reconstruction in Syria and Iraq. And uh, I will continue my talk with Mr. Rayburn. Moscow or even Tehran have the money uh, to rebuild Syria, and it's a very pricey uh, price tag. It's some say it's two fifty billion dollars. Some say it's. $500 billion. So who can afford this? Obviously the US and, the, and Europe or, or no? Well, I, I think before we address that question, there's, uh, there's a question that has to be addressed before it. And it, and it has to do, it also has, is related to the issue of the refugee problem that the gentlemen were just commenting upon. If you want to solve a problem, you have to address its root causes. Uh, you have to treat not just the symptoms, but you have to cure the disease. Uh, on the refugee uh, issue in particular, uh, we, re we, we, we all see that Lebanon, that Jordan, that Turkey are bearing a disproportionate burden uh, in hosting uh, millions of Syrian refugees. We see it, uh, it's a situation where, uh, incredibly, about half of the pre-war Syrian population no longer lives in their homes. But the question, the question isn't what is, the, what is the process, what's the mechanism for them to go home. The question you have to answer first is why did they leave their homes? It's, it's not as though the weather changed. These people were chased from their homes by a regime that terrorized them and hasn't stopped terrorizing them. This, this conference uh, today and tomorrow falls in between two really grim anniversaries. Uh, one is the April 4th, 2017 chemical attack against Khan Shekhoun by the Assad regime. And the other is the April 7th, 2018 chemical attack against Duma, again by the Assad regime. Not to mention the 2013 uh, chemical attack ag against East Ghouta that killed uh, over 1,300 people, and on and on and on. Uh, the regime has not changed its hostile behavior toward its own people. The regime chased those people out of their homes, and the regime so far has shown no interest in having those people go back. Uh, so it's not the refugees who are the problem for Lebanon, Turkey, and Jordan, and others who are hosting them. It's the Syrian government who are the problem. And what's the U.S. doing about that? The, the, US. the U.S. government was one of the first to say that there's no replacement to Assad. He's going to stay there. We know very well if the international community wanted Assad gone, he would have been gone by now. We didn't say that. What we, what we have no, said... No, you intended. The, but no, we, we, didn't, we didn't intend that either. What we have said repeatedly is that it's for the Syrian people to decide their own leadership, their own government, through a political process that the Syrian people should own and lead, that the international community can help to facilitate, but that the Syrian pe people have to choose their own political fate. Really, uh, if that process has to begin and the Assad regime has got to stop its hostile behavior, its attacks against civilians, uh, its uh, rounding up of, of people, who disappear into their prisons because in addition to the refugees, another obstacle to reconciliation and to political stability in Syria is we have the question of the fate of more than perhaps 200,000 yes, Syrians who have disappeared into the regime's sure. prisons. But, but we know very well that the U.S. is on the ground, has boots on the ground in Syria. Turkey has boots on the ground in Syria. Uh, Iran has boots, in the crown, uh, boots on the ground in Syria through proxy 
militias and uh, their own Russia to everyone is in Syria. So the, the Syrian people are not left alone to decide their own fate. But do I understand from your conversation, is it too soon to talk about reconstruction? I, I, let me put it this way. Uh, what, the, what the Assad regime and its patrons, Russia and Iran in particular, appear to want is having been the main factor in the destruction of Syria, they would like for the rest of the international community to fund the rebuilding of what they have destroyed, but to do it without uh, any political reform to address the root causes of the conflict, to, without changing the nature of governance in Syria so that refugees will choose to go back because they feel safe in going back uh, and without changing the participation of the people in the, in the political system to determine their own political fate. So in other words, at this stage, those who are talking about reconstruction 24-7 really are asking for the international community to underwrite a military solution to the conflict that is futile because, as I said before, there's no military solution that can be sustainable. So I think we have to be talking about a political settlement. We have to be talking about a political process that can actually lead to political reconciliation in Syria and one that has with it accountability for the atrocities that have gone before because people will not politically reconcile without some accountability for what has happened and they will not go home feel confident that they can go home safely if they're just facing the same killing machine when they go so back. So this might ten, take another 10 years. I don't know how long it is, how long it would take. For our part, we're optimistic and we're hopeful that it, that uh, a political process can uh, can be underway, can begin to make progress far sooner than that. In our view, the conditions are there, and those who the, those who want to continue on with the military solution are ignoring the reality on the ground. It, in our view, 2019 should be the year of a reality check for the parties to this conflict. They should realize that they are not within reach of a military solution that will get them their aims, and that this is the year to switch from the battlefield to the negotiating table and to come up with a sustainable, peaceful solution. This, you mean Syrians? I mean, ev I mean all parties Russians to the conflict. Russians included. Including Russians, yes. Um, you had a comment, Ms. Alalaymi. Yes, I just wanted to go back to the role of business. Mm -hmm. I think actually business has such an understated and powerful role, not just in the things that you mentioned, but also in instituting the values and the culture. So through corporate culture, through corporate col policies, big business can actually um, move society in advance of government policies. So things like diversity and inclusion, values of you know, tolerance, coexistence in the workplace, and at the end of the day, if we really think about it, most of the threats, the issues we face, um, particularly conflict, are a crisis of values. So this is where business can actually help in reconstructing these values and that societal awareness and consciousness. Mr. Alam. I totally agree. I mean, she's absolutely right. Uh, business has a big role to play. And uh, if, I, I, if I were to switch in Arabic, <laughs> I would say that <laughs> the private sector has a, a major role to play, but also the private sector needs to have the groundwork to be able to work. We cannot ask the private companies and the private sector to work in an illegal framework and to work in, a, in the framework outside of the international community that does not allow it uh, to work naturally in a natural ecosystem. They have to, we have to have infrastructure and groundwork for that. And I believe to go back to our main issue, Reconstruction. Reconstruction requires the reconstruction of the current economies, reconstruction of the legal frameworks, providing, uh, of course, legal uh, security for uh, that allows businesses to work and prices to work. Yes, businesses have a role to play. They ca they affect the development of countries. Uh, on an ethical, we're on ethical uh, level, on the level of values as well, and and uh, it allows the youth to be 
to be safe and not to encourage the, and not to drive them towards extremism, extremism, but rather it, it, businesses will help them to really to put uh, more concentration on building their societies, communities, and families. Your Excellency, Mr. Ambassador, re uh, holding the Syrian regime uh, the, uh, as sole responsible. The Syrian regime was there before the problem, before the conflict. There are parties that contributed in really uh, giving birth to this problem that really instituted chaos in our region as a whole. The true solution, as the real solution, is in instituting a framework of peace, reconciliation among the people, to really rebuild um, solidarity among the people. We believe or we feel that international community is not serious enough in fighting hatred, terrorism. We do not believe, feel in the region that the international community is taking serious steps to fight terrorism and extremism. Is this the role of the Americans or the Iraqis and the Syrians? The role of Iraq and Syria, they are living in a part of the world, in a region. The world has, is play, has a part to play in the solution and in the problem when we feel that the international community is serious in fighting terrorism, we understand that our Iraq, the problem is not only caused by the regime. There are parties who have contributed in the conflict and they are still fighting and stoking problems and stoking hatred in the region. Since you're talking about Iraq, I will take Mosul as an example. and. Mr. Rayburn also can participate in this discussion. Mosul. We know war against ISIS ended in 2017 in Mosul. Did anything change on the ground? Did reconstruction take place? Was a building really reconstructed in Mosul one year and a half? Reconstruction is different than reconciliation. Reconciliation uh, depends on awareness, social awareness. Reconstruction depends on a state of law, a law that is built on accountability, transparency, where government, government is held accountable. Whose role is it? Is it the role of the Iraqi government or the role of the Americans or the coalition that have bombarded ISIS and that have led to destruction? The role of the Iraqi, of the Iraqi government. The others have to help. The government. The main burden is shouldered by the Iraqi government. Our problem in Iraq requires ethics in governance, which is something missing in our in Iraq. We do not have this transparency in government. We've lost that. Reconstruction is not the work of the people, it's the work of the state. The state has to be a state of law. So uh, the capital can invest. In and can play part in the construction. Even the neighboring countries can invest. If, if the, also if these countries do not want Iraq to be stable, if they do not uh, really support our reconstruction problem, our main problem is from the neighboring countries. I remember Prime Minister Hariri. May he rest in peace. When he wanted to start reconstruction, he first went to the neighboring countries. He saw to what limit he is allowed to reconstruct. Today, our problem is that the Iraqi people uh, are understanding that there are countries who do not want Iraq to rise again. Iran, for example? No. The problem is not in one country. There is a general atmosphere. That is why the new steps, the steps of the new government in Iraq uh, to open and reconcile with Jordan, Egypt, Arab world, and others, finding this balance, this equilibrium, is really to lay the groundwork towards reconstruction. This is what we need. Our problem is to have an ethical state. M say impression that, right, Russia has leveled to the ground so many uh, cities and the uh, Syrian regime as well. But there's also a general impression that the uh, coalition has destroyed a lot in ISIS-held, strong-held uh, areas in Syria and in Iraq. Also, post-Saddam Hussein, uh, the main facilities that have been bombarded were not renovated by the international community that took these steps. Uh, again, who's going to pay the price for this reconstruction? We understand that the international community is worried about 
worried from terrorists and ISIS and Al-Qaeda. But after destruction, isn't there any responsibility on the same international community to rebuild those countries and cities and areas? Uh, if you're talking about Syria, I mean, the vast majority of destruction in Syria has, has come uh, in the major population centers of Syria. That's been done by the Assad regime itself with the help of the Russian Air Force and with the help of uh, Hezbollah and the uh, Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps. R Raqqa uh, and Iran. Baghouz don't look much better. Now, Raqqa, uh, Raqqa and Baghouz are an interesting, are an interesting problem. Uh, because over four years, or th more than three years, in, in Raqqa, uh, Daesh was able to turn most of Raqqa into into one big uh, uh, in, in, into uh, into one big bomb, and was able to construct uh, military defenses there, uh, and then fight from civilian areas in, in, in a way that made the fighting very very difficult and and very costly. So. Uh, I, as a, as a former military person, uh, looking at the military problem as it unfolded in Raqqa, and also in, in West Mosul in, in, in particular, uh, Daesh had a military plan to have those cities destroyed uh, and, to, uh, and to, fight from, uh, to fight from civilian areas and to try to inflict as much, uh, try, try to provoke as much damage as possible. So there's a lot of rebuilding to, to be done in Raqqa will and, and in Mosul. Will the U.S. take part in that? The, the Raqqa U was a good example so far of getting rid of ISIS. Are you yeah. contributing to the rebuilding process? Sure. Uh, the the U.S. the the rebuilding I think uh, the rebuilding of Raqqa. Uh, I've been to Raqqa uh, and I and I've seen. I think the the people there are are uh, are very resilient. Uh, they just need the right conditions, and, and I think the life of that city will take off. It's already coming back uh, to some degree, which is a stark contrast to parts of, uh, uh, of Halab, for example, yes. or Hama and Homs, which remain in ruins and, and, and depopulated. So the, the conditions are, are quite different. Uh, the conditions of Mosul uh, are, are very complex. Uh, look, the, the thing about Mosul, I say this not as a... Uh, in, uh, uh, Mosul is not something that I work on today. I said this in my other life as a as a historian of the of the war in yes. Iraq. Uh, we saw since 2003 Mosul change hands. I I used to count I think seven or eight times, uh, and each time uh, the proximate cause was a political struggle that extremists on both sides were able to hijack and turn into a conflict among different communities. So as I look at, at Mosul out of the corner of my eye from Syria, uh, that would be the thing that I'd, that I'd worry about first, is that the community has to come together. The fabric of the community uh, has, to come, has to come together, or okay. else you'll see it change hands again and again. I'm, I want to come back to you and talk about the Caesar Act uh, that probably uh, stops anyone from rebuilding anything in Syria or, or around it. Uh, but uh, I want to go first to Mr. Hasbani. Mahi al wasfa Minister Hasbani, what is the recipe for reconstruction? Will the Lebanese have the opportunity to reconstruct uh, Syria, knowing that Caesar Act is a draft law uh, in the American, in the U.S. Congress uh, that uh, does not allow to give money to the Syrian regime? And currently, the major opportunity in Lebanon is to reconstruct the Lebanese infra infrastructure to stabilize the Lebanese economy, the infrastructure in Lebanon that was uh, really affected by the crisis in the region. Talking about reconstruction in Syria is still early before having, as we've said before, having final solutions uh, uh, to the situation in Syria, which allows the institution or the establishment of a permanent framework for reconstruction. We have to look uh, always at reconstruction. It is not a, uh, they are not packs or packages of assistance that come without conditions just to reconstruct buildings, facilities, and infrastructure. If if we do not have a comprehensive re reconstruction and rehabilitation of the of governance and of control systems of the uh, state institutions in order to manage the reconstruction if 
reconstruction is only an alternative uh, uh, for really rebuilding government, this reconstruction might not be sustainable and which will lead to great burdens on the government from loans and other financial burdens on the long term because reconstruction is not sustainable without institutions. So the main condition for a successful reconstruction to any country post-war, post-conflict is to rehabilitate, reconstruct state establishments, state administrations, uh, st state uh, legislations and use them in, in the reconstruction process in uh, instability. This way reconstruction will be sustainable, will lead to a sustainable economic process that will allow sustainable investment without really ha having to recur to loans. And this is, uh, we're speaking about experience in Lebanon after the war because reconciliation is uh, the basis on which the state institutions will be built and accordingly we will be able to reconstruct uh, facilities, institutions, infrastructure, and administrative, comprehensive administrative procedures and a uh, state of law. Mr. Be uh, Mr. Bajani, the GDP in the, uh, in the region compared to the U.S. Uh, is very low. Why are we optimistic when we are listening to all of this discussion that is not encouraging? It is very low even if we compare it to the world. The world, the GDP of the world is around 88 trillion U.S. dollars and this region as exp only has three, mil, three trillion GDP in GDP. Yes, uh, the challenge is big, but the opportunities are bigger. Yes, it is true from what we are listening that we are living in a very difficult environment, uh, neighboring countries, uh, benefits, interests. Uh, but if I want to talk again about businesses, uh, if we look at the countries as a business, all businesses have competitions. We cannot, uh, we cannot uh, think that our compet uh, competitors uh, that uh, will uh, uh, will help us. We have to shoulder our responsibilities. The Arab youth, the Arab region needs development needs, job opportunities. It is not a matter of talking, of thinking, of waiting, of reconciliating, not reconciliating, because really reality is ahead of us today. Are you ready to invest in Libya, in Iraq, in Syria? Listen. As Majl, as Majl Futain Group, we are committed to the region, but we invest pragmatically. Yes, investment should be according to what reason requires state law and international law that facilitates that procedures uh, for investment to, to be there there is a saying that says that capital is a coward no that capital is ration is, is rationalistic pragmatic i hope everyone will will follow the this uh, this rationale just to give you an example when Majid Al Futain, uh, when Majid Al Futain opens a shopping mall in, for example, Lebanon or Syria, how many job opportunities you will provide? Wherever we are, we are in Lebanon. We are present in Lebanon. If I give you Lebanon as an example, City Center Beirut that we've uh, opened in Lebanon really created thousands uh, of job opportunities, 4,000 to 5,000 job opportunities. Opportunities for the front city also created more than 10,000 job uh, opportunities or employments. Carrefour, for example, market thousands of job opportunities. These projects are mega projects and, and really create sustainable job opportunities and allow the businesses to grow and allow certain people to develop, etc. So this is how we can build a serious uh, economy, but this cannot take place if we do not have a set of law, if we do not have the, the correct uh, groundwork. Big investors like Futaim and others now even think about Syria with Caesar Act coming. Uh, well, uh, Caesar Act hasn't come yet uh, from, from Congress, but uh, our administration supports it fully, and, and we hope to see it come uh, because we, we see it, the situation, I would turn the situation uh, that you presented on its head, uh, which is that we think the Caesar Act, which is an instrument of accountability for atrocities that have taken place in Syria, that measures like the, uh, like the Caesar Act are necessary 
to get to that accountability uh, that is essential for political reconciliation, which is, uh, wh which is the only thing that can make reconstruction or outside investment sustainable. If you do this without political, if you, if you seek investment or reconstruction without reconciliation, without the political reconciliation, which is why it's very wise that this, this session is called recon reconciliation and reconstruction because they go hand in hand. You're, if you reconstruct under those conditions without reconciliation, you're building on sand. Yes. Because it, whatever you construct is going to be destroyed again because mm -hmm. you haven't addressed the root causes of the conflict. I should wrap, Lena, I'll give you the final uh, word. Well, just especially what? that you have a book that's called Compassionate, Ter uh, uh, Compassionate Counter-Terrorism. Counter um, so actually, what really worries me with this getting locked into this cycle of endless reconstruction is there is a um, Al-Qaeda legacy document, a manifesto called The Management of Savagery, Idarat al-Tawahash. And it outlines in prescriptive detail how their strategy is to polarize, to cause chaos, destruction, to overextend um, predominantly the US uh, And they have succeeded. So they see it as this is how the Soviet Union imploded. And so this is, and it can, the same can be argued yes. that this is their strategy with Arab governments. And we are you know, feeding into this strategy. So that's really kind of what keeps me up at night. Um, I would like be be, be, be just <clears throat> then. In brief, there is an inter, uh, interconnected con uh, uh, world today. We have to find a human cooperation, a human partnership that believes that humanity is one family. Without this feeling, we will remain disconnected and not connected. I would like to thank my speakers, my panelists, and I always remind you that wars end. And cities f flourish again. But who lost a father, a mother, a family, a child, nothing can really compensate that. And this is the price of war. Thank you.